I recently presented this model, which is a Lego model of a roller coaster from the video game Theme Park. In that video, there were a lot of comments and questions, and that's why I have this video. The first thing I want to show is why did I change from these old trains to these red only smaller trains? And there you see the main issue. So these trains have a high center of gravity so the risk of being jammed like you just saw is much higher than with the new ones one person asked me what happens when you have more than three cars in the trains now the trains have four cars and let's see how it goes Okay, good. Go. Five cuts. Let's pretend like it went through here and go. So obviously you need more speed here for when it runs with five cars, but let's pretend like it went well and do six cars. Is that guy holding an ice cream? Yeah, that might not work. Yeah, that's why you're not allowed to bring in ice cream with you on the roller coaster. Yeah, so here you really see the problems accumulating. When you have long trains, the trains just don't go as fast. But let's just for fun do with nine cars. <laughs> well, let's go. I did not expect that. A frequently asked question is why do I use these circular loops instead of the more realistic teardrop shaped loops like this? It is more realistic because the g-forces aren't as severe on the people being in the trains when going through this kind of loop. My main problem was to get these loops intertwined and that I just simply couldn't make a nice solution with this kind of loop. Now that I have more experience I'll try again and see can I incorporate this because this is so cool. One thing that is also really cool to see on these loops is how much chafing there is. If you look closely you can see there are red marks on my loop elements. Really severe up here but they are also continuing. And they are on both sides. They come from the trains. So if I take a train car here you can see they come from this part here going along the train track. And then there's a lot of sideways forces causing this red part here to actually deposit some material onto the track. This gives a lot of friction. This kills the roller coaster cars and elements in the end. But that is for now just something I have to live with because of the intense speed that I'm running on this roller coaster. And the reason why I'm running with such high speed is because I want it to be reliable. It turns out that the loop coaster in Lego is a section taller than it needs to be because they also wanted to improve reliability. 
Let's take a closer look at this section right here. Here you can actually see the geometry and how everything works. So we come from a lifting piece like this to a curved piece that is flat. And the transition between these two pieces is possible by simply using modified plates with clips and bars. One goes on top of the piece here, the other one below the other one. And that is how you get this connection. One of the bigger pain points has been the slow section. So that's on top of the lift and also in this lower section of the whole track. So when you're having a downward slope like this in a curve, there's a big risk that the train actually stops here. Now I didn't do it right now when I demonstrated it because of course it doesn't. This is where if you're developing your own roller coaster, you would observe that you can test a lot and see this shouldn't be a problem. It goes through every time, but as soon as you put it up on uh, the roller coaster, the train doesn't do this, Whoops. but it actually stops here. And that is why you can see from the top of the lifts and even in sections like this, I'm typically doing two downward slopes right next to each other in order to make sure that the train always clears sections like this. Here's my initial solution for the gap of length two. So it's just two panel pieces mounted between two tracks. This works nicely nine out of 10 times, but once in a while you are just unlucky and then you have a derailment. So I needed a new solution and in the video you see I invented this. Using these two modified one by two plates, I still, however, need the straight pieces right in front and the back of this little piece here in order to minimize how much of sideboard forces are on this uh, improvised piece because otherwise this can also easily fail. But it is much more reliable than the old solution and I also think that it looks really cool. So that's why I included it in the video and also showed you how to construct this. On this bike prime, I had pipe bricks. You saw how I programmed it in the video. And Pyprex also allows you to use these non-standard sensors like this I'm using for activation. It's from the LEGO Boost sets. And this is from the LEGO Vidu, Vidu 2.0 that I'm using here in the tracks because it fits really nicely between this kind of track piece. A cool thing about this sensor, as you can see, I've built it into the base here below, is that it's really good for activation. So visitors who see the models here on a layout, when they see a red light, they know they can't interact. And when they see a green light, they know they can interact with it. And that is a nice and clear way of making people interact. So if I turn it on, it turns green. And when I activate it like this, it turns red until the trains return and then it turns green again. You might ask, why are there lake pieces with fish in them? And why is everything just this flat green? And that's because that's what it looks like in the video game. It also helps when you actually put other modules together like the coconut shy here and of course many others that you can see in my other videos because that's when we get the figures that are walking around trying a lot of rides they can't go in and try the roller coaster unfortunately but at least you have the activation and even with the coconut shy you have the clap activation and that's why this suddenly becomes a much more fun layout when i take it to events what is up with all of the colors you see on the base and also on the pillars that is all to help me set up this module when I take it to events. I have marked the sections here underneath. So there is a marker of the direction where this has to be placed. So this is always up and then markers down here to show me where should it be placed. So here you see zero up, one to the left, one brown for left. If I take the next one, it's going to say this direction zero up and two to the left marked with red and also the number of pieces just to make it really clear these little corner pieces indicate where to put the support beams below these show which kind of pillar should be placed on top so green and red i know okay that's you going there green and brown well that's this guy green and orange well then i have a similar green and orange pillar here. This indicator here on the side tells me how tall should the support on top be. Brown for one plate, 
let me find something that needs some more. Here on the side you can see it's yellow. And then I'm using the color decoder for resistors, saying brown is one, red, orange, yellow. Yellow is four. And this is one, two, three, four plates tall. So that's why I know which top is here. In case it falls out or off during transport, then I can always recreate this. For the lifting mechanism, I started out by just copying what Lego had done in the original red roller coaster. This is why you see chain guides like this, and why I started out with just having the base without the power takeoff on this side. I didn't even show that I added the power takeoff to this kind of base in the video because I cut it out, but I think I'm going to make an uncut video where you can see the full process. I started out by just pulling from below, and even from the start I had this annoying skipping motion on the lift, and I thought it was actually due to chain skipping down in the base, and that is why I changed or I made this setup where I have two gears that are both pulling the chain in order to be really strong and really pull with a lot of force. But having this setup here in the base of the roller coaster meant that it was very difficult to put the chain on if it should jump out of this module. And the power takeoff here was also an attempt to make the movement more smooth. This didn't help because it was, of course, the cars that were too tall causing this jerky motion. Realizing this and knowing how annoyingly difficult it is to replace a chain in this kind of module in the middle of this, when there were potentially not just what you see here, but also a lot of other modules sitting next to it and making sure that I had to turn everything off just to fix a chain. Well, that's when I realized I should make something simpler. And that's where I changed to this much simpler kind of lift module where you can see how easy it is to put the chain in here because you don't have to go into the module it's just here on the top and it still has the power takeoff that helps transfer power from the motor and onto the top of the module i'm using the big 40 tooth gear because that really allows me to reduce the bend that i have above the little yellow bar right here where the chain bends and puts a lot of pressure because there's a lot of chain going down to the train when it's pulling up a train right here. And I always want to save the elements as much as I can. And those are the technical and design details of the roller coaster. I hope that this video answered a lot of your questions. If not, you can still keep asking them in the comments below and I will answer as much as I can. That's it for this video. Let's just see the roller coaster run once more and then that's it. Oh, you could even see that it started because of timing. And let's follow the trains. So as you can see, I put the blue haired ladies in one train to make it clear that the trains are actually changing sides when they go for a full round. And ready to launch. And that is it. Thank you very much for watching.